Welcome to another episode of EMZT Radio. I am Bane Hellborn with my partner, the infamous MJ. Hey, everybody, we're back. No, we're not streaming yet. Sorry. A lot of things. No. I, I need to explain this. A lot of things I thought we had fixed in uh, when we were doing the uh, testing of the stream. I thought everything was fixed. I thought, you know, this, this will be great. We'll have everything ready. Eh, I was wrong. Mm, shit was happens. Wrong. Apparently, my computer cannot handle it. So. Shit happens. Yeah, I know. Shiitake mushrooms happen. So. Yeah. We're not streaming. Matter I- of fact, the we might not be streaming EMCT Radio, period. Oh. But yeah. through creative destruction comes more projects, which means we can focus more time on getting YouTube projects and the like ready to go. Mm-hmm. That's we that'd will be have better. YouTube. Yeah, we'll have, we'll have some YouTube projects in the mix here soon. So, okay. Don't you fret, you little children. Oh, I gotta say the funniest thing that happened to me on the phone today. Mm-hmm. It's funny. So, you know, all day long you probably get the usual telemarketers trying to call you and stuff, right? Of course. So- <laughs> God knows I do, and debt collectors. But that's so the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this one. He said he was from sort of uh, financial solutions, and I'm like, "Uh uh-huh. And he's like, I'm talking to the homeowner, right? I'm like, no. He's like, oh, you have such a pretty voice. I love you. Goodbye. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) You have a voice for radio. Has anybody ever told you that? (laughs) That is the funniest hang-up I ever had. You have such oh, a pretty man. voice. I love you. Goodbye. <laughs> you have a voice for radio, my dear. A voice for radio. Uh, it was 10 years in the making. Yeah. <laughs> so. God, it is amazing, isn't it? We have like 30 combined. We're not we're not trying to toot our own horns here. But in the words of of our president, if we don't toot our own horns, who will, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We have like a combined 30 years of radio experience. So mm-hmm. if you're looking for any voiceover acting, please keep us in mind. No, anyways. In um, fact, I'm trying to get in. I'm trying to get in on voice actors in my local area. That's what I should do. That's what I'm trying to do now, too. I'm, I'm trying to take up like yeah. odd commercials and stuff. You can um, yeah. email emctradio at gmail.com. Uh, we will take PayPal donations for mm-hmm. voice work. Just yes. put that out there. Anyways, yes. some people may We have hear, an interview coming up. We do have an interview <laughs> coming up, but I want to get to this real quick. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Because it's exciting news. Okay. People are listening to us on Spotify now. Woo! Yeah. We're on Spotify. I'm, we're on Spotify. We're almost legit now. <laughs> I know. We're almost one of the big Almost. Boys. So, yes, um, share it around Spotify. And don't forget to link us back to the Podbean app. We link will leave a the link the... in yes. descriptions because I'm right having there. a hard time finding us on the search. I found us. It comes up. You found us? How did you? Because every time I, I look, it came up some sort of um, music thing that's called EMZT. <laughs> because I have the email with the link. <laughs> <sighs> that's how I found us, dude. <laughs> Okay, but anyways, we do have an interview coming up a little bit later in the program. Please inform. Antonio Pantoa for One Must Fall, which I've talked about before. It's going to be fun. It is going to be fun. We're going to have a lot of fun today. We have a lot of fun planned for this show. No, we don't. (laughs) We're just lying to you. Uh, (laughs) Are your pants on fire? (laughs) I hope you're doing something fun while you're listening to us. Uh you know, uh, making love in the back seat of your car, whatever you're doing. Maybe you're on that run. Hopefully, you're not around children. Are we good for sex? <laughs> I'm great for sex. What are you talking about? <laughs> I don't know about you, but man, I'm I'm a sex panther. Meow. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Yeah. My bosses know about this. So, and okay. they listen. So anyways, 
All right. Now that we've done some damage, let's go to some music. (laughs) Yeah. Now that my career's in turmoil, let's go to some music, shall we? Let's spin a record right here at EMZT Radio. Don't forget it! It's a running buffet! All you can eat! Don't mess with me. I got the power of EMZT Radio and whore on my side. The show that puts the story back into history. History is all about discovering the why. And I think that in that process, it's important to never take the story out of history. Making history come alive, one episode at a time. But this is a podcast on the American Revolution for this series and uh, all about a free country, so do whatever the hell you want. Visit themondayamerican.com to get more. Dive into the Monday American. Don't worry, we'll be gentle.
This is Luke and Wolf, and you're tuned in to the delightful darkness of EMZT Radio. Well, we're back. Um, we're back. Welcome back to the news. Anyways, uh, it was told over our sabbatical, which we will not go into, um, <laughs> that Friday the 13th is dead, as far as the game goes. Now, not they're not going to, you know... They're not going to discontinue online support no. or anything of that nature. But if you were looking for new content, sorry, Charlie. That's that's on hold for a while. Yeah. Uh, for a long while. Forever. Well, they said indefinitely. They said indefinitely. Yeah. Well, and and he made a good point. Uh, the And his name escapes me at the moment. The creator uh, made a good point. He said, look, you know, why would you waste your time making new assets for the game when you don't even know you could put them in. So yeah. even if tomorrow a judge rules, okay, you can go ahead, it's still going to be months 
before they can do anything because they basically have to start from scratch. It's just like if um if oh and I got a funny video game story that we'll tell after this. Uh, okay. Bethesda has done it. It's Wes but, Keltner. Yeah. Yes, and you know Wes made that made that great point. And I mean, it's like if we had a video game and Bethesda came up and said, you know, hey, look, you're too close to Fallout, um, mm -hmm. which is in the news, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you need to you cease and desist until we can get the court to figure out if you're, you know, in violation of copyright. Well, why mm -hmm. the hell would we go out and make another tree in the game? Just let people enjoy the experience they have there. Mm -hmm. So I kind of get their point. But... Yeah. Oh, I want to get to this. I want to get to this Bethesda story because it is fucking hilarious. Okay. Okay. Bethesda is suing Warner over the new Westwood game that's supposed to be coming out, mm -hmm. and they're saying that it is too close to Fallout Shelter. Oh, now, really? What is the basis of the basis of the lawsuit? Will have you in stitches. Bethesda found this out found out that they were using part of the code by, get this, mm -hmm. identifying the bugs in the game. Oh. Their bugs are just the same as our bugs. Is that not peak Bethesda? I mean, yeah. <laughs> if, there was, if there was no other story that comes out this year other than, <laughs> than that, it is the most Bethesda story ever. Hey, Hey, we know you're copying our source code because you know we recognize the bugs. We recognize in it. those bugs. Oh my god! Because we put them in our game. See, Todd, it just doesn't work. Wow. Yeah. So, anyways, yeah, that wow. that happened this week too in video games. That is hilarious. <sighs> okay. By the way, seventy nine dollars for Fallout seventy six. Isn't that kind of high? That's extremely high. I know you get the beta test. It probably will be like 40 bucks when it comes out in uh, November. Okay. But I don't know. Maybe, I hope with this $70 bundle, I'm about honestly about to drop 80 bucks for this. That I get wow. a map of West Virginia, that I can get other things other than this, the beta testing as well. Because you, you can, uh, if you pre buy the game, you beta test. That's what a lot of companies are doing now. Mm -hmm. Is. And I have to admit, it saves a lot of money in the long run for what they're doing. It actually makes you money. Why not make the money on the beta testing and put it yeah. in the hands of the people who you know are actually going to play the game? Right. So the right. the beta the the pre buying beta testing. Somebody else did it too. I think um, the new um, I want to say the new Rainbow Six game is going to be like that too. Possibly. There's there's a lot of other things that are that we'll go into beta testing where you can pre-buy and you'll be part of the beta testing squad. I like that idea. It's a good money maker. And plus you get it in the hands of the hardcore fans real quick. Mm -hmm. So yes, Definitely. I still have not played vampire. I'm hoping to have acquired it by the time the next podcast comes out. So I can actually give an actual review on vampire. Ooh. So yeah. Yes. Any, anything else uh, in the video game genre? No. We move over? No. Move on. <laughs> All right, where are we moving to? Music or movies? Where do you want to go? Actually, I got something for Supernatural. Oh. This was this is very interesting. Um this was sent out to uh Jared Padalecki, Jensen Ackles, and the whole Supernatural well, to basically them. It's a proclamation from the mayor of Austin. Uh-huh. Let's see. Be it known that for 13 seasons, Jared Padalecki, Jensen Ackles have been to hell and back on the CW network series Supernatural, but they've always come home to Austin. And the CW has just renewed Supernatural for a 14th season of The Incredible Adventures of Sam and Dean Winchester. And I'm sorry. Hold on a second. Why? What? what? Oh, yeah. Season Where can you go from here, man? There's going to be well, a lot of pot in that room. Well... Season 13 deals with Lucifer Jr. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I, I knew it. And I the shit it. that happens to Lucifer. So they got to wrap it up and do something else in season 14. Yeah. So anyway, 
Supernatural fans from all over the world are gathering in Austin, bringing the best fans in the world to the greatest city in the world. Now, therefore, I, Steve Adler, mayor of the city of Austin, Texas, do proclaim June 23rd, 2018 as Supernatural Day. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Good job. I mean, seriously, no. No, I mean, but but honestly, though, the the show's been on 14, it will will be on 14 years. 14 years. Yeah. So, you know, kudos to them. But, and, and I guess we can make a smooth transition to The Walking Dead on this. Yep. Um, Jeffrey Dean Morgan is still on the show. Mm-hmm. How long? We don't know. Uh, but it was announced. Now we know the fate of Rick. He'll be leaving soon. And Maggie. Uh, and now Maggie. Yeah. Maggie. And, and come on, man. Are you serious? You're just going to write her off off screen? Really? Yeah. And what's going to happen to her kid? That's what I want to know. I guess she'll. she'll yeah. I, but I have a feeling that's probably how how they'll explain it away. She died in childbirth. Oh, since you know that's how sad. every ev- the fate of every woman that's given birth on that show <laughs> yeah. happens. Died in childbirth. Yeah, and the one Darryl. woman that's given. Birth yeah. To oh yeah, that was that was brutal. Oh, Carl. that was so rough. Carl. Oh. Carl. Okay. <laughs> But they're wanting Daryl to take over as leading man. Ugh. Daryl's going to be the only member of the cast by the time we get to season 10. Pretty much. And I'm pretty sure a lot of the, the female audience doesn't mind. No. It's just going to be <laughs> Daryl doing Daryl things. That's, just that's Daryl. Season ten. That's season 10. <laughs> we'll just wrap up season 10 with Daryl just doing Daryl things. Because he's going to be the only the one with his cast. bike and his, bo- his crossbow and whatever. Just be him. <laughs> I wonder what they're going to do to Michonne because um, the actress now, and, and damned if I can't, I'm bad with names today. Danae. Uh, yeah, Danae is going to be probably the biggest you know, African-American star mm-hmm. uh, in the world here soon if she's not already because of Black Panther. Oh, yeah. So yeah, they're not going to be able to afford her. So what, I wonder what's going to happen to Michonne. Well, it's starting to sound like it's going to be Z Nation. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what's going to happen. Oh, no. I bet you anything. I, I already have a feeling. I've, I've, got it, I've got it written in my head. They're going to kill Rick, and then we're going to get Farmer Michonne. <laughs> that, that's what's going to happen, folks. They're going to kill Rick, and we're going to get Farmer Michonne. Probably. I, I don't know. Farmer Michonne know. having to look after Judith. Yeah. But there was also talk that there's going to be Shane back in it for a couple of things, yeah, probably f- as flashbacks, because he's dead. We know he's dead. Rick killed him. Yeah, Shane is <laughs> fucking dead. Leave Shane alone. They're they're going to have oh Rick we- do flashbacks. <laughs> I, I wonder if that's going to be for the death. I mean, I, I'm honestly thinking at this point, that's probably what they're going to do with mm-hmm. Rick's death. Yeah. Is have, that's when the flashbacks are going to come. While yeah, because it's... Dying. Because that's Cause what they it's do. Gonna be, it's going to be his biggest regret about losing his best friend. Yeah. But, and how but, it went down. Yeah. But but that's what they do. Whenever they're dying, they do the flashbacks, and then you get the uh, uber sad music, and, mm-hmm. you know, then yeah. and there and there. Yeah. So, yes. So, there's our TV report for you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do some music real quick here. Um, do some music news. Epica has a new album coming out next month, for those of you who have not heard. Now, if you live in Japan, which, you know, hi to the three people that listen to us in Japan, um, <laughs> you already probably have this album. Epica mm-hmm. is doing uh, an album called Epica vs. Attack on Titan. Mm-hmm. Now, for those of you who don't know, Attack on Titan is a very successful anime. Yep. I've heard two. I've heard Crimson Bow and Arrow... And if inside these walls was a house, this is, <laughs> this is, and coming off of Epica's last album that they did, I'm telling you, they have really, I, I don't know what it is, but they have really just taken their music to another level. Because, you know, they're using real orchestras now. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, the last album they did was, was, they're using real orchestras. 
And I mean, I don't know what it is, but it it has just raised the level of their music. I was a fan before. Now, you know, I'm one of those people that probably would run over his own mother to get go to an Epica concert now. Just be- <laughs> I'm serious, just because of how good, how much better they've gotten. I mean, this is absolutely outstanding. I love it. Oh, I haven't, I have not heard this band, so I'm sorry. I can't comment. Well, you need to get on Spotify, you know, after you listen to UCT <laughs> Radio, and Google search or, or search in Spotify if this. Let me, let me make sure I got the title right. If Actually, this, if yeah, inside these Spotify. walls was a house. Okay, well, there's, I'm going there's there. some singles. There's some singles on Spotify. But if inside this, these this walls album. is a house, is one of, yeah, one of the best freaking songs inside on the new okay. EP. But yeah, their their quote unquote new album that came out I think in 2016, um, it's their newest, is on there too, and it is absolutely insane. Hey, I got a couple more things uh, to talk about. Chris Cornell okay. is going to be honored with a Human Rights Hero Award. Hmm. So um, his award will be for the Promise. The song he wrote for the film of the same name of the art about the Armenian genocide. Very good. At least somebody can acknowledge the fucking Armenian genocide. Okay, good. Looking at you, young Turks. And you know you wanted to hear this news. The 500th consecutive uh, retirement tour of KISS uh, announced European dates <laughs> for the weekend. Oh, boy. They will be uh, kicking things off, as a matter of fact, they'll be kicking things off next week at the Barcelona Rock Festival in Catalonia. Ooh. And they'll play another game. They'll play another game. They'll play another Another game. Yeah, you can tell where my mind is. (laughs) It's not (laughs) of the World Cup or anything. (laughs) Ha ha, Germany. (laughs) Ha ha, laughing at you. Uh, (laughs) And then uh, July 8th, they will be uh, playing another gig in Barcelona at the Wisnik Center. Or the, yeah, the Wisnik Center. And then they're in Vivero on July 14th. Okay. There you go. And one more for you here. Two-Faced Center has signed with the Extreme Management Group. These guys also do uh, Cretopsy, Suffocation, Misery Index, and more. The band is currently working on a new album. And uh, they are out of Lima, Peru. Oh. So enjoy that. Exotic. Exotic. South American metal. South American metal is awesome. <laughs> it really is. I mean, it's expanded over the years. And, um, you know, it, it used to be Mashuga. Right. Basically. Right. You know, it's, now it's just really all over the place. And this, I think this is the first time we get to hear, at least in the mainstream, uh, metal out of Peru. Huh. Maybe. So, yeah. I haven't heard. So, uh, single gentlemen, if you want to bang metal chicks, go down to South America, apparently. <laughs> and the last drive-in with Joe Bob Briggs yes. is on, going to be on Shudder. He's doing a 24 to 26 hour marathon because he said Shudder doesn't care. He's picked 13 of the best low low budget horror movies that we know yes! like like yes! tourist trap sleepaway camp back yes! case to name a few i'm so hang can, can you can you hold that thought i have to go get my lotion real quick <laughs> <laughs> and this is I'll gonna be, wanking be while you're doing this joe bob briggs very last drive-in show so you know what though uh, yeah. i i'm i'm actually happy for that and i hope because i think didn't uh, well, if let's say if Shutter wants a series out of this because mm-hmm. we haven't heard yet whether or not Shutter is going to do another uh, a series of this. I know that they're picking up the old Monster Vision shows, if I'm not mistaken. Um, hmm. I would like to see Joe Bob Briggs maybe produce instead oh. of um, okay. I want to see Joe Bob Briggs produce instead of doing something doing something in front of the camera. Hmm. Why not? Yeah, because he's um, connected. <laughs> he is so connected. He is. So I mean, yeah. I would love to do that. And, and Joe Bob, if you are actually, if it does get picked up and you need people, hi, Hello. we're available. Hello. Hi. hi. So July 13th, 9 p.m. 
Eastern Standard. Get your subscription to Shutter. Yes, and I've paid you can even years. do it with you can even do it with the free trial to Shutter because yes. I think they do like uh, what is it a cup uh, twenty four hours free Shutter. It's like a week. So okay, but I mean you could just get the free trial and watch this because this is going to be awesome. And while you're at it, you can watch other awesome stuff on Shutter. I watch more Shutter. I'm not I'm not kidding either. I got rid of I, I'm, well, I got rid of Netflix a long time okay. ago when I found Shutter and Screenbox. Right. So, I mean, and I haven't really regretted getting rid of Netflix. <laughs> well, but now you can't see season four of Lucifer. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> I checked out Lucifer at about season two. Oh. I was just mad as to why Fox was getting rid of all their good shows. What was the Gotham. reason again? Football! Oh, oh right. And, and the WWE. F- fucking football. And the WWE. And the WWE. Okay. Wow. Okay. I'm currently watching Lucifer on Hulu, so yeah. Yeah, you can still watch it on yeah. Hulu for a while. Yeah. I'm pretty sure Netflix won't, won't, won't let you do that. Anyways, let's <laughs> spend some tunes. It's CMCT Radio. Back in a little bit. We got an interview. Pay attention. Something like that. Anyways, back in a minute. <laughs> You are now listening to EMZT Radio. Chronicity, a state of prolonged duration, recurrent, habitual, chronic. A new miniseries on chronic pain and illness by your friends Matt and Phil from Semi-Intellectual Musings. We go beyond medical diagnosis to explore the often forgotten political, social, and personal sides. You'll hear stories from extraordinary people overcoming extraordinary challenges. Authors, entrepreneurs, volunteers, coaches, and caregivers. They are so much more than their diagnoses, yet each have found ways to persevere. You'll also hear some familiar voices from the indie podcast community. Showing that art, creativity, and passion are possible while living in chronicity. These stories and more starting April 1st at thesim.podbean.com.
matter? Can I get your ghost, Bob? <laughs> You're listening to EMZT Radio. We are back. And today we have sitting with us Antonio Pantoja for his film project, One Must Fall, which he kept the title. Yay! <laughs> it's, an, uh, it's on Indiegogo. It was on Indiegogo. Uh, Antonio, thank you for joining us today. Hola. Thank you so much for having me. Hi. Okay, so tell us a bit about your project. Uh, it was on Indiegogo.com, and we did give to it because I, you had me at 80s-themed slasher horror comedy. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing that. That's so cool of you guys. I'm just curious, how did you find it? I think I was doing a search through uh, Indiegogo. I just did like a horror search, and, and your your project popped up like, second or third on the list you're kidding no way man i, I got yeah. super lucky with it. i had no idea so i should have asked you that beforehand really but thank you guys so much for doing that it's super, super cool of you um so uh your original question was what was the movie about was it yeah tell us a little okay. bit about okay. the movie sorry. <laughs> sorry so i get super sidetracked also uh I, I start to ramble too so i apologize um but the movie is about um a girl who is uh wrongfully fired from her office job uh, due to sexual harassment. She has a boss who's just a chauvinistic jerk, and he fires her, and it forces her to get another job temporarily because she has a son that she has to care for, and she's a single mother. So she takes on a job on a crime scene cleanup crew. And a lot of people don't know, but that's actually a real job where people clean up murders and suicides, and they have to clean up the aftermath, body parts, blood, brains, everything. So, um, so she does it. She has a weak stomach. She's a very empathetic kind of person uh, to emotion. So, um, so she does it, but she realizes that um, that you know there's the, there's a reality to these situations. So the film is a horror comedy, and we make comedy of a lot of uh, bloody situations. However, um, there is a reality to it where somebody has lost someone, you know, close to them. So these are real people that they're cleaning up. So, anyways, I always thought of the question like you know these people are on the job hours after 10 people are murdered you know uh yeah. the, the crime scene cleanup crew comes through and they clean these people up but where does the killer go like is the killer apprehended are these people even safe doing this job the police have already left at this point so uh so i thought about it what if uh what if somebody was loose the killer was on the loose and uh he killed dozens of people and they got to clean up all these people in this gigantic warehouse what if the killer's still there with them you know and uh oh. so I did that, and, uh, and the movie came out um, better than I deserve. Much better than I ever deserve. <laughs> it was perfect. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you, it looks like you got only about half of your funds through Indiegogo. Yeah, honestly, and... I just put an arbitrary number up there. Um, so I yeah. already had the, the funding for the movie, to be honest. Oh. And initially, we, um, we did it just to market the film, uh, more or less. And uh, so we, we already had the money for the film, but we did that anyways because... Um, it would be a good way to just put it out there that we're actually doing that. So, uh, so I talked to my producer, who's Gil Holland. Um, he's like a he's like a Sundance darling. He's had like dozens of films in Sundance, and um, he's the only person ever to win it three times in a row. So yeah. we we talked, and he thought it would be a good idea, and uh, we did that. And then we had extra funds, which actually ended up coming in handy because I went like ninety three hundred dollars over budget um, because you know uh, crew is dependable crew is very hard to find. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yes, they are. Oh wow! So, um, so what's happening? So, what's the update on this film? It's already been uh, shot, and it's and what's happening to it? Yeah, actually, uh, this is like perfect timing for this podcast. So, the yes. film has been shot, and um, and I did like a rough cut of the film, and it took me like a uh, month and month and a half, and then I passed it off to my editor Matt Niehoff, who is amazing. He's much better than me. He does special effects. He's just he does all the Hallmark movies around town. He's really, really good. So um, this is uh, this is right up his alley, though, because this is more his style of film. So um, so he's finishing that should be this weekend. So probably today it should be done. And I'm going uh, to his studio tomorrow uh, to look at his version of the film. But I already cut kind of what I wanted in there, and it ended up being way too long. So an hour and 47 minutes where a slasher typically is about hour 25, mm -hmm. hour 30, so we need to minimize that number, and that's what he did, is I cut out anything that it just really didn't add to the story enough, and um, and I'm not married to any of it. Like, I just want the best thing for an audience, right? So I'm, I'm, right. I'm not this pretentious asshole who's like, I need 
all my stuff in the film and I need it said exactly how I wrote it because sometimes that doesn't work out, man. It doesn't translate to an audience. So, um, so I thought it would be – Stephen King said this. I thought it was really awesome. He said, um, write with the door closed and then rewrite with the door open. And what he meant by that was take everybody's advice. You know, Take it with a grain of salt, but listen to everybody's advice and their opinions when you're rewriting – and that kind of goes for editing and the whole process as well. You know, you have to be really open-minded and make sure that people aren't gun-shy to give you advice. So so uh, I want to see Matt's cut. So I'm going to see Matt's cut um, tomorrow, and I'm really excited about it. And it should be like a much more minimized version of my cut, and it'll uh, the story will progress a lot faster. And this was your first feature film? Yes, this is your film. So I've done a bunch of shorts before, and uh, I've been shooting music videos, which are almost like shorts. Mine are, at least. Um, long time, and I got to shoot music videos with people who I've idolized um, growing up. So been very lucky with that. So I've kind of like made their music videos into short films that I wrote. And uh, yeah, man. So I've done a ton of those, and this is actually yeah my first short film. Right. And uh, so Drum. what's your what's your background for for doing movie making? Um. So uh, initially, I just did it as a passion. So uh, my dad passed away in 2009. And um, and I didn't do video back then, but I had two seconds of video of him uh, a week before he passed away, and uh, and I watched it like a million times. And then my daughter would always say, "Can you tell me stories about your dad?" And I'd say, "Baby, Aww. I think I told you all of them, because he was an immigrant from Peru. He came here and he didn't speak English or anything. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I thought I told I told her all of them. I couldn't remember anymore. And then I thought it would be so amazing if uh, if I started recording people who were terminal, because I remembered my dad's video. Oh. Uh, record people who were terminal and they could tell their stories to their grandchildren that way they could like put a DVD on and address their grandchildren right then and there I thought oh. that was amazing so um started doing that and then I did like some weddings and stuff like that and I realized they were emotional and I begged mm-hmm. someone to let me do their wedding and it just came out great man and uh and I entered like the 48 hour film project when I only had a camera for a few months and it came out good I was lucky so um so yeah man it kind of progressed after that and then that passion um, moved me into a different job. I was managing a call center, and then uh, then I became the creative director for our new station here in Louisville. And uh, you know, just by my demo reel, I had no experience in news or video or anything. And so I put together a demo reel, and they hired me on my horror stuff. All my stuff is horror. So wow. They hired me like based on horror stuff, and I uh, started producing like commercials and stuff like that for them. And then uh, and then eventually, I was like, well. I really just want to do this on my own, so um, so I broke away from the news station, which is uh, people were calling me stupid for it because it was my dream job and I made good money there. But uh, but I wanted to pursue this full time and and make it the best that I possibly can. So um so yeah, so I did the feature. Um, I, I, I my wife left town for a week and gave me a chance to like decompress and not have the kids around, and I wrote the film, and mm-hmm. uh, in a week. And, uh, and then we refined it over the next few months, and yeah, that was it, man. It was uh, very lucky, you know, very lucky in the process. So you are a lifelong horror fan. Yeah, uh, when I was kid, when I was a kid, like um, I was pretty much raised by the television. So like my <laughs> family just never saw. My dad always worked, so he was a laborer. So I actually like never saw my dad for real. And uh, my mom, I came from a really broken home actually, but um, oh. but uh, so basically, you know. I, just watched television. I learned all of my morals from '80s movies, to be honest. Yeah, uh, we me didn't too. say yeah. <laughs> so we didn't say I love you at home, or we didn't eat together. We didn't talk about anything. And uh, but the one thing that we did is when my dad got off work, he was a laborer. He'd work till the like late at night. But he would come home and he'd be like, "Everybody, get on the couch and let's watch a scary movie." And I think <laughs> from that, like uh, a lot of people, I think I posted it on Facebook and I had like a thousand replies where people were like, "You know, I can relate to that." And, uh, and I thought that was so funny because I thought that was a unique story about myself, but a lot of people were able to relate, and we just get this sense of unity. Like, that, that's the only sense of family unity that I have is through horror, and I think that's um, – and I, I, think, I thought that was unique, but a lot of people feel that way. Yeah, because my parents were totally against horror movies or horror anything, so I never got to see it. If I, had to, if I wanted to watch it, I had to sneak it, like when they were asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Me too. I, I feel weird because I'm the only one Matt, that actually sat down with my mom and watched horror movies. No, no, I was not allowed. I would get, wow. I would get spanked if I did watch. Wow, yeah. it was worth it. Totally worth it. Oh yeah. my god. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm wondering okay, if I came so, from a weird home. Anyways. <laughs> so, uh, what are your plans for the film? Where are you going to show it? Are you going to enter it in some uh, film fests? Yeah. Um. 
so uh, so my film is very unique um, in in the sense that yes. uh, um, it's it is horror comedy, but it's it's going to be very different um, than most uh, structures of how films are written. So uh, I think that you'll see that in the film, and it's uh, and then also uh, I have a gay character who's a very strong character in the film, and um, nice. and yeah, and I think that's very unique in horror because I think that there's a uh, gays are the typical stereotypical trope of uh, gays in, in horror are that they're just fodder for the killer and they're just yep. they're yes. just this stereotype that's, uh, that's very unnatural. Yeah, the, the, I've noticed that too. It's like they're very all of them are very effeminate yeah, characters yeah. and and they're all weak. With the exception, yeah. I'll, I'll say this though. Right. I think my favorite gay horror character is Lafayette from True Blood. Yes, yes. that was. I, I think that. Blood. What's that? I've never seen True Blood. I wish. Oh now I need to watch God. it. Oh, oh my yeah. God! Laf- you need to see it. I'll say this though: Lafayette is probably the way. If, if I wanted to see a gay character in uh, in a horror movie, that's exactly who I would picture. Because I mean, he's got that. He's still kind of effeminate, but. He's got these strong, you know, angry moral values, and he's still a damn good, entertaining character. And that's yeah. what you really want. I remember the AIDS murder and, scene. And he finds out he has uh, powers. So, yeah, it helps. <laughs> but I mean, it's just, no, I just that's that similar to mine, probably. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say oh, just yeah. that, so, that AIDS burger scene. It, it, AIDS burger. I, I mean, if you, I mean, seriously. <laughs> If you just watch that one scene on YouTube and it, yeah. it will explain everything about what I like about Lafayette in one scene because it was it's just so beautiful. So. Yeah, and he takes no shit from anybody. If somebody like wants to call him names and whatnot, he does not take it. And he's a cook. So if somebody complains about his cooking, he does not take that shit either. He's like, oh, you can get the hell out. <laughs> but the kicker at the end, though, tip your waitress. Yeah. yeah. Well, so I made my character um, just how I see stereotypes of gays because um, I shot for a gay magazine for uh, for several years and I got to hear oh. coming out stories and and things like that and I, I kind of real and I've made friends with so many people in the gay community because uh, I shoot fashion also as well so like uh, that's just they're they're great at fashion there's a lot of makeup artists who are gay males and anyways um, I think that the true stereotype is that they're very brave they're very loyal. And they're some of the greatest people that you'll ever meet, uh, you know. And I think that it, it takes a lot, you know. So, um, so I put that in my film, and I thought that was the true stereotype. So, since it's unique, um, my producer, one of my producers, Gil Holland, uh, the one I mentioned about Sundance, he's got a lot of films in Sundance. Mm-hmm. Um, he thinks that we have a chance to get into Sundance. However, I don't, because I, you know, I, <laughs> I don't think it's that kind of film. But, um, you know, I don't, I don't see many slashers in Sundance. But he really seems to think that we have a really good shot. So. We're going to pitch to a few film festivals and see what happens. And, um, yeah, and then uh, if not, you know, if we don't, you know, make it into anything, then I don't know. You know, we'll go to VOD or whatever, whatever works. Um, but he's very well connected. And he knows a lot of people, including Jason Blum, and he wants to do a private screening with him and things like that. So we'll, we'll just Blum have house. To yes. see what happens with the game plan. So, um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I love the film. I hate all of my stuff. Um, if you've seen any of my photography and my videos, and stuff like I hate all of it, but I love I love uh, One Must Fall is my favorite movie. Well, well, <laughs> I think me, we're all critical of our of our projects. Yeah. Well, let me yeah. let me ask you though. Um, be, coming from the photography background, has that how has that really helped you in the doing the cinematography and and just directing in general? Oh, I think it helps a lot. So, um, my photography is very different. Also, so it's a, a lot of composite work, which means I take the photo. And then I layer it into other backgrounds, and I put a lot of things into the photo that weren't there before. Um, so my photography is very, very different and very dark. Uh, I think it has helped me a lot, but um, but to be honest, I wish I would have taken more chances. I wanted to play it a bit safe with compositing and VFX and stuff like that with One Must Fall. Mm-hmm. So um, so it's, it's it doesn't look like my photography, I don't think. So if people are expecting that out of um, One Must Fall, that, that's not what they're going to get. But it, but it's a true '80s film in that um, it's all practical effects. So there's no oh, good. Yeah, it's all practical effects. And I got um, one of the best practical effects artists in the entire world, um, Vincent Guastini. He did like uh, Jared Leto's arm in uh, Requiem for a Dream, and he did 
Last of the Mohicans, and he did the taking of Deborah Logan when the big snake, you know, eats the girl. And oh yeah, yeah, he's done, and uh, that thing went viral. Like he, he's done um, Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back and Dogma and the Wings and Dogma and all. He's done a, a bunch of them. So he did all the practical effects in mine because I didn't want any cutaways. Like I wanted the the effects to happen right on screen, just like an '80s movie or like maybe even a more sophisticated '80s movie. But I didn't want any VFX to ruin my film. And I'll tell you that uh, I also I think that these, um, since you guys have video on, but I don't know if this will be broadcast in video. But cell phones I think have ruined uh, the slasher film because you know you can't just always say, oh, there's no service here. You know this building, there's no. I'm so sick of hearing that in films, like in. <laughs> But like, so I had to figure out a way I can get to be honest to make the film happen before cell phones happen, and and that was the '80s. And uh, and honestly, it was like it was a lot more work to do that because I had to get all the props and I had to get all the locations and make sure all the cars were '80s. Like, it was tough, but um, but yeah, I eliminated cell phones from the film because I feel that cell phones ruin slasher films. What's, they kind of do. Okay. Yeah. What's what's the hardest part of trying to get it? I guess, quote unquote, get it right when it comes to an 80s movie. Doing it now that, you know, my God, I'll be 37 next month. So being now that the 80s are practically 30 years old, what's what's the hardest part now? Is is it the cars or is it even trying to find pay phones? It is. Honestly, all of it was very difficult. So um, so my film is very props heavy. So uh, so I was getting like Doritos bags unopened from the 80s and like Coke bottles and Pepsi cans, you know, that kind of thing. And it was extremely difficult. Um, it was. It was very hard. So I went to every antique store and probably the, the 100 miles that surround my area. And I got, like, some of them would have cans, literally. Like, you, you go to, you know, antique stores and, and flea markets and stuff like that, and you're like, who would ever buy this stuff? <laughs> eBay but is a prop me, man's best friend. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I got all that stuff, and... Um, I got, you know, like 80s taco flavored Doritos and stuff. Like I got all that <laughs> stuff, man, and it was hard, but um but it was really cool and I think it added a lot. I just didn't want people to to feel that they were taken out of the film because there weren't enough props in it and it didn't feel 80s enough, you know. So um so the music is very 80s and and all that stuff as well, but um the hair and makeup has to be right. It's it's mm-hmm. very difficult. Uh the, the whole set dressing has to be completely redone because uh it has to be it has to be right. But that was only just to take cell phones out of the film. You know, that was I did all of that just to take cell phones out. <laughs> wow. Yes. Yeah. Wow. That's kind of overkill. <laughs> yeah, it is, but it's worth it. So, like, oh, uh, you know, if, if you were to if you throw in like cell phones into any of those films that you love, it would change everything. Like, if Friday the Thirteenth, you were talking about the video game, for example. Like, um, what if there are cell phones in it and they could just like call nine one one and get there, you know, get police there immediately and like. That would ruin the whole thing, you know. Like you were talking about changing one thing in one in a film. Mm-hmm. What if you changed that thing? You know, somebody spotted Jason. He killed one dude with a bow and arrow, and then like somebody called the police, and then that's yeah. it. That's over. Cuts an hour <laughs> off the movie. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So how how long was the filming? Um, I did it in ten days. So like it was extremely ambitious. But since the budget that we were working with was micro budget. Um, under two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars, you know, you don't have a ton of money to to, to work with. So, um, so you have to do it really quickly. So, more days cost more money, obviously. So you have oh, to yeah. pack it all in. So, I basically wrote the movie based on one location, so that I knew that I didn't have to make company moves and I didn't have to lose any time, you know, setting up or transporting people or anything like that. So, I wrote the movie based on pretty much one location, and it was that warehouse where the guy killed all the people. Mm-hmm. They show up. Um, so the film starts uh, in an office. You know, the girl gets fired from the office, like I mentioned. And mm-hmm. uh, and then, you know, she's she's at home and she's immediately, you know, working in this warehouse. I mean, we walk through the process of it, of course. But but I think in order to do a film really quickly um, and really efficiently, cheaply, you have to minimize your locations. Yeah. Well, yeah. Now, yeah. Uh, I want to I, I got to ask this because I like asking this of, of micro budget uh, film directors. What is what was your biggest challenge? Like if you if you didn't have the small budget you did, and what what would what would have been the one thing you would have changed? So if I had like um, an arbitrary number, like a million dollars, or ten million dollars, or something like that, r- regardless of the number, 
Um, I would have just had more days, to be honest. And I did it consecutive, so I did 10 days consecutive. So I needed everybody to be in character for 10 days, all of my cast, right? So I didn't want to break that up and have them leave and take off a week and come back. I just felt it was not good. So it had to be 10 days. But, um, but if I could, I wish that I could pay them more money so they could take off more time so that I could maybe even stagger it a bit, like have a day in between, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that with more money, that's the only thing that I would change. Um, and that, that was the only struggle, to be honest, because, you know, I'll work 20 hours a day, but I'm not going to put my actors or my crew through that. So, like, even though I'm willing to do that, I can't expect them to do that, you know, because this is my dream, you know, and they're enabling me to live my dream. So I'm thankful to them. I'm working for them, to be honest with you. So mm -hmm. um, I can't put them through that. So I would have to stagger the time that they came in and, um, and ensure that, these guys aren't working 20 hours a day. I'm, I'm down to, but I, I can't do that to them. So that's the only thing that I would change is either have more days or stagger the days just a little bit to give them time to recoup. Because even, I mean, hell, even a 12-hour day for an actor, um, you know, is very difficult or crew, you know. So, uh, so you know, I had to stagger people and stuff like that. But but other than that, like, I, I think I could do I could do a lot with uh, very little money. Well, <clears throat> I, I gotta ask this, especially shooting in in Kentucky. Uh, how creative can you get, like shooting where you're shooting? That's a great question. So the good thing about shooting in Kentucky is we don't require. Um, there's no red tape. So if I want to go shoot, you know, on the street or anything, nobody's gonna ask me for a permit. However, I'm on the film commission here, so you're supposed to get a permit if you want to uh -huh. shoot street. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but you know, like it's you know, nobody's gonna ask you if you go to a. Uh, uh, liquor store and you're like, yo, um, we're about to shoot a movie. Can we shoot in here? They'd be like, yeah, man, that's awesome. Can you shoot the outside of it too? Like get my yeah. name in it, you know, versus like LA or New York. Um, they'd probably slap you with a fine, call the police. They'd do something. They'd mm -hmm. maybe jack the price up $10,000 a day. I don't know. But yeah. here in Kentucky, they're going to be really excited about it. They're going to help you. And if, and that's generally how the culture is here. So like, yeah. if I see anybody on the street and I'm like, yo, man, um, you know anywhere I could shoot, like, in a, a bar? They'd be like, yeah, they'd stop and talk to me. You know, they would stop everything that they were doing, and they'd be like, you know what? My buddy Daryl owns one down on Forge. Let me call him real quick. Like, they would literally do – they're very um, very hospitable here. Like, the Southern hospitality is very real, and, um, and I'm lucky to live around it. So, like, uh, you know, everybody's willing to help here. Yeah, I'm in Arizona, and people are like, you want what? What? <laughs> yeah. No, I don't want to be on camera. Fuck you. <laughs> that's why. That's that's why a lot of the movies are getting shot down here in Albain. <laughs> yeah. I, so I, I, I shoot a lot in Kentucky, and I have a lot of clients who come here. And uh, and a couple times, clients have like gotten out of an elevator or something. And they're like, "Are people always like that here?" And I'm like, "Like what?" And they're like, "This lady was interrogating me in the elevator. They were asking me how I'm doing and about my life and stuff." And I'm like. <laughs> Well, yeah, man. Like, we just talk to everyone we see. Like, we don't – we just – I mean, we weren't trying to interrogate you. Like, that's – we just talk a lot, I think. Okay? We're trying to be he friendly. Yeah. If he would have gone two more floors, she would have invited him to church. <laughs> <laughs> so true. It's so true. It is, yeah. And then hooked you up with her daughter. <laughs> it is no, so no, true, that, that's very... only Georgia. You don't have to worry about that. That's oh, it's in Georgia. Georgia. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Arizona, they're not that nice. It's, I mean, we have we have – we have red tape over here. Yeah. <laughs> at, at least that's, that's not how we do things in South Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't wear my foghorn leghorn accent. But yeah. My uh, second AD is from South Carolina, um, Sweet. Silas Rowland. And he's an, uh, he's an amazing um, director himself, an actor, director. But, uh, but he drove from South Carolina to Kentucky to, to do the film. He was my second AD, and he was amazing. Um, wow. I couldn't imagine that because it's a pain in the butt to get to Tennessee from here. Mm. We had people from all over. We were very lucky. So um, most of the actors were uh, were non-local, actually. So we had a lot from Atlanta and uh, uh, L.A. And uh, they were from all over. Crew from New York. Um, so yeah, we uh, it was not a full-on Kentucky production. Wow! Did uh, everyone get set up in someone's house to crash? <laughs> no, crash no, we uh, we got them hotels. So everybody had their own hotel. So we didn't. Uh, no, no, we uh, we pay travel expenses and we pay for hotels and. Uh, so, like, I don't get paid, of course. I pay to do this, right? So, like, my money's in the film. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I would pay to do this all day and uh, and just to make sure that these guys are comfortable because I'll sleep on the floor. I'll sleep in the location. Like, I don't mm -hmm. care, but, but I will, I will, I'll make sure that these guys are, um, are treated like royalty. 
<laughs> um, that leads into a good question. Uh, outside of the crowdfunding, when you were shooting this, did you find outside investment sources, or is this 100% coming out the bank? Yeah, no, no, no. It's not all me. Um, I'm just a third investor in it. So um, I had two other friends who uh, who I initially sent my business plan to, and I didn't expect them to invest in the film, but, um, but I sent it to them, and I just trust their business acumen so much, and I respect them so much that I said, um, will you take a look at this and give me advice? Because... I'm going to be looking for investors for my film soon. And they looked at it, and they were like, I'm going to give you both of them. I sent it to two people, and both of them said, I'm going to give you the money for the film. And I was like, what? Are you kidding me? And they both said, yeah, I want you to live your dream. And, uh, you know, it's not a gigantic multi-million dollar investment. So, yeah, man, I'm, I want you to live your dream. So I trust you, and I, I know what you do. So just take the money and do it. And then uh, and then I did. So, um, so yeah, it's not, it's not all my money. I'm just a third um, – partner as an investor in the film and did you ever get to do your uh how to make a movie workshop yeah no i haven't done the workshop yet but i'm doing like a dvd series that's um that's included in it and uh so basically like uh if you buy a dvd or you maybe we'll sell it separately i'm not sure maybe i'll give it away for free i'm not completely sure but um but basically what i'm gonna do with it is just every single step of the process so i hired a behind the scenes guy tommy baker who um who recorded every single step of the way uh, throughout the entire process, so writing, shooting, editing, all of it, and uh, and then he's got interviews with every single cast, every person who was cast and crew in the film, including Lloyd Kaufman, who's my idol. Uh, nice. He's in the film. Uh, I don't know if I even told you guys that. Yeah, Lloyd Kaufman's in the film. The uh, the director of Toxic Avenger, um, yep. the president of Troma, he's in the film with his wife Pat. Uh, Pat Kaufman, uh-huh. who used to be the commissioner of New York Film Commission for the last 25 years, she just oh. retired, but she's in the film also. So, um, so he's got like a lot of really, really great advice as well, and uh, and we walk through the whole process. So, yeah, man, by the time the film comes out, um, that's going to come out alongside of it. And I just didn't know that there was anything out there like that, you know, uh, that yeah. showed you how to do it from start to finish, from financing cradle to the grave to completion. So, so yeah, that's what I wanted to do. Yeah, well, there sort of is, but it's very, very, very expensive to do. I've seen but, a couple of them. So, like, yeah. uh, I've seen Dub Simmons' workshop, and it's it's just him talking. Like, it's not a – it really never takes you inside of it. And then I saw uh, Lloyd does one. It's a book, and then it has a DVD series, but it just interviews with random people. So I really wanted to go through, like, all of the full gamut. Because that's also what piqued the interest in your project was uh, that you also – because you were learning how to do this, and you want to help – other people try it and you wanted to do these workshops and i thought that was an amazing idea and 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 you're and then you're taking it further you're going to make it into a dvd yeah and then um, eventually i'm going to do like uh workshops that are like a retreat so like i'll go so i've done workshops before for my photography where i do like a uh lighting shooting and editing all in front of everybody so like Mm -hmm. i have a model or two and then they'll go through hair and makeup while i speak for a little bit and then i'll i'll set up my lighting i'll tell them all about that and then i'll shoot and I just shoot a few frames, like 20 frames or something, because I shoot fast. Mm-hmm. And, then I, and then I edit the whole thing in front of them. And to be honest, I didn't know if, like, one person was going to show up to my class or, like, five people. But, like, 300 people showed up to my class, which is wow. pretty cool. So, um, so, yeah, so I'm thinking of doing the same thing with uh, the workshops for how to make a movie, except make it, like, a week long where, like, I'll go get, like, uh, a series of cabins. And, like, uh, we'll go out there. And then we'll, you know, we'll stay for a week. Food will be provided. And every day we'll do the whole process that I did for One Must Fall. And they can do like a short film out there. But I'll have actors come in and just other people who represent um, different parts of the crew come in and talk. And and then we'll just go through the whole process, writing, shooting, editing, same thing. Oh, see, that's that's what I love about people just like paying it forward. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Because, uh, you know... Uh, a lot of uh, independent filmmakers, they have to figure it out on their own. <laughs> and the, oh. the, other, the other hard part is, like, where do you get, who do you talk to about permission to film, locations, uh, costuming, things like that. That's the other, the other side that needs to be addressed, too. Absolutely. It's yeah. very difficult. And then it's honestly, like, uh, to be 100% honest, Lloyd Kaufman is kind of the one who, um, who pushed me into making the film. So... Initially, I thought it was this big dragon I had to slay. Like, this is my first film. I, it's got to be perfect. I can't mess anything up, you know. And I said, what? What? What's the? What's the market? Like, what? What do I? What kind of film do I do? What does the market yield? And what do people watch? And what do they hate? And Lloyd like yelled at me. He was like, dude, 
He's like, you freaking do what you want to do. He's like, don't worry about what other people want. He's like, everybody said that zombies were dead until The Walking Dead came out, you know? He's like, you do what you're passionate about. Do something that's entertaining. And he said, it's just your first movie. It's not your last movie. This is mm -hmm. just your first one. Don't think of it as like this big dragon you got to slay. And, and honestly, man, he said, you, be, you do that movie and I'll be in it. And I was like, I'm doing oh, it. Oh, nice. Oh my God, Lloyd! <laughs> oh, it was great, man. It was great. I was just lucky, you know. Everything has been lucky, and honestly, I've I've just asked around a lot. So, like, I met Gil Holland just by asking, you know, just by being present. Um, I met Nathan Thomas Milliner. He does like the the covers for like uh, Sleepaway Camp, and he did the cover for like Halloween Two and uh, the Shocker, like big movies, you know. And then he did my uh, poster art also, which is amazing. Like, just by asking, you know. How, how do people get a hold of you to find out about the film? Honestly, man, I just do Facebook, <laughs> which is so bad. <laughs> but, um, but, like, you're right. I, I need to do a website and put, like, blogs out there that people can follow along, at least with what I'm doing in my progress and stuff, like a diary entry almost, a yeah. journal entry kind. Diary's more, like, personal. Maybe I just need to be journal entry. Well, <laughs> but, like, I've I, I like the updates that people can do on Indiegogo after the co the campaign is done. That's that's where I've been getting my information. <laughs> oh, okay. So for the film, you got your in information from Indiegogo? Yes, still. Oh. I mean, the last one was from March. Yeah, so. I didn't know if anybody read that ever. So I never got like a response ever before on it, you know? Oh, um, yeah. So I was like, I don't know if anybody is reading this. Like, uh, there's nobody out there, you know? But, uh, but I didn't tell uh, on the Indiegogo, I didn't say this, but... I was on the uh, Robert Rodriguez show, Rebel Without a Crew, and they were going to follow me to do One Must Fall. So they were going to have like a, a documentary crew follow me throughout the process of making One Must Fall. But um, but it was in October of last year. It's already been filmed now, and like the show is out now. But yeah. um, but it just didn't work out, like contractually and stuff like that. Like it just didn't work out, and uh, they were even going like, to give the money for the film and stuff. But but and I, I wanted to be on the show, but. It just it, it wouldn't have worked, and I had to film it in Austin, Texas, and stuff like that. I have no resources oh. there, and um, it just wouldn't have worked. And it, it was the film is much better since I didn't go on the show. And I watched the show, and the show was awesome. But this movie was almost a product of uh, of that show. I almost committed to it, and I mean I did like forty interviews, forty Skype interviews. That's the only way I like even have Skype. I told you I'm terrible at it. <laughs> but, like the casting director used to call me all the time, Anna Sturgeon. She's awesome. But um, but I made it like all the way through, all the way to the end. Sent me the contract, and I just couldn't do it, man. Couldn't do it. Oh uh, yeah, because that's how I found out about that too. You had it posted in October about you were almost on that. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. close, man. But they got a really good roster of people, and I still talk to the producer and stuff. And he's super cool, and some of the guys on the show, they're awesome. But um, but yeah, man, I just didn't. Uh, I ended up just doing it separately, and I think it was a much better decision, and the film uh, was much better because of it. So, do you have Facebook for the movie? Yeah, I'm just uh, Antonio Pantoja, and it's a soft J, like jalapeno, so it's uh, <laughs> Antonio <laughs> Panto, and then it's like J-A, that's how, right. Pantoja, everybody always is curious how to pronounce my name, uh, and that's probably the only Spanish that I know, is that soft J right there, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, a lot of people are disappointed when they meet me, they're like, he didn't even have an accent, that's pretty unfortunate, <laughs> So, um, no accent. I'm just uh, born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky. And, uh, yeah, just a fake Spaniard. Spanish last name. <laughs> so uh, do you have any other projects that you are considering? Yeah, yes. absolutely. So um, so my next film is going to be about um, – have you ever heard of Devil's Breath before? Yes. Um, so those who don't know, Devil's Breath is this drug that comes from Colombia – and uh, it's broken down into a powder, and somebody can blow it into your face, and then you have no will anymore. So if you if somebody asks you to lay down in a bathtub and cover yourself with water and drown yourself, you'll do it. Or if somebody asks you to empty out your bank account and give them all the money, you'll do it, and you won't remember it. So oh. you'll go back to the bank, and you'll be like, what happened? Like, why, where's all my money? And they'll show you the video of you taking out all of your money and signing all the paperwork and giving it to somebody else off camera, you know? But um, so that happens a lot in Colombia, and it's not very popular here. Nobody really knows about it. So this is a real drug that really exists. So uh, a lot of people think that there's a conspiracy behind it. Like when people do things like uh, you know, crazy things that they might not remember, and they're it's very big publicity. They don't remember even doing it at all. Um, but they may think it's the product of uh, devil's breath. And a friend of mine gave me that idea. 
just uh, a few weeks before he passed away, and he just passed a couple weeks ago, actually, Andre mm-hmm. Green, and, uh, and I'm going to do him right, and I'm going to make the movie. <laughs> oh, that sounds great. Oh, thank you. Oh, wow, that's kind of scary. It's scary. It really exists. You should research. It's called Devil's Breath, and um, I forget the scientific name for it, but uh, uh, Scopolina, uh, Scop- Scopolamine, Scopolamine. But yeah, check it out. Check it out, Devil's it- Breath. It sounds a little bit like uh, Serpent in the Rainbow with the, the zombification powder. No where way. It paraly- where it paralyzes people. You know what's funny, man, is I've seen just about every like horror film, low-budget horror film out there. And I've got a list of about 100 movies that I haven't seen. And Serpent in the Rainbow, ironically, is on that list. I need to see it. <laughs> that film was so amazing to me about all the trouble they had to go through. They even had to have like a voodoo priest bless them to do the film. No way, man. You're to, kidding to- to keep them from being cursed because you know they were there at the time when all that shit was going down with uh, the government the government's coming down and then the the i forget the police are called but they were like trying to keep them from being there and they had to get like a voodoo priest to keep them from being cursed because everybody just throws curses everywhere in that in that place <laughs> so <laughs> it's insane I, I didn't even know that no i had no idea yeah, that was. It's very interesting. The the bonus features on that uh, DVD for that movie. You should you should really take a look at it. They did like real research with voodoo and this powder and all that. It was it's fascinating. That's insane. And, I wonder and if it's scary. Me. I I don't remember what it was called, but I don't think that was one of the names. But because th- you know their powder, it paralyzes people but keeps them conscious, so they know what's going on when they're paralyzed. So this is the same thing. So like a. Uh... Yeah. The people, like, when you when you do this to somebody, like, they're still articulate and things like that. Like, they're still them. They're not, like, drunk or, like, a zombie or anything. They still act like themselves, yeah. but they just have no will. So they used to use it as a truth serum back in, like, the Cold War, the oh. where POWs were and things like that. If they caught somebody, they used to use sculpting on them. And they would ask him like, you know, question, and they would have, they would answer honestly. So they used to call it a truth serum, the truth serum. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah, crazy. That's 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 gonna be scary. That's gonna be scary in itself. Just that story is scary. So good good luck with that. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm gonna. Um, my wife is leaving town in like a week and a half with the kids, so that once again I can uh, decompress, write my movie without my kids here. So uh, so yeah yeah yeah. I'm gonna do that uh, in like a week and a half or two. <laughs> oh yeah, and please come back when uh, when you have that going, so we can talk about it. Man, that would be awesome. Yeah. I, so, like, during that process, like, I'm isolated from the outside world. So, like, I'll just disappear for two weeks while I write this film. But uh, but I'll, like, I will only, like, get out for dinner or whatever. And, I, like, I use that time to have, like, dinner with friends and stuff um, just because I need to, like, be around people. But, uh, but yeah, man. So, like, after that two weeks, like, I'll just reappear again and I'll have a movie. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Well, anything else you wanted to add, Matt? Oh, no. I guess there's only one thing left to do. And, uh... We'll give you the floor. Just promote away. Where can everybody find you? Um, I'm just on Facebook. I'm just a dad. Um, I don't do anything really cool or anything, so I wouldn't follow me to be honest. Um, <laughs> but uh, but like uh, if you like, I mean, if you like really weird photography, you can look at my stuff. But uh, but I'm just on there. I would just say the only people I'd like to promote is you guys. Just like listen to this show. <laughs> continue to listen to this show and uh, and people that they support because uh, you guys are doing something really amazing. And I'm so thankful that you even considered having me on. Oh no! Thank you so much. This uh, I'm looking forward to this film because '80s themed horror comedy slasher. I mean, awesome, <laughs> awesome you. concept right there. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Thank you guys so much. It's been an honor, and I'm I'm so thankful. And if anybody needs anything or has any questions or uh, needs help with anything, um, be, uh, if you reach out to me, I'd be happy to help in any way I possibly can. Thank you very much. This has been Antonio Pantoja for One Must Fall. Stay tuned, and we'll let you know updates as soon as he lets us know. Consistent reports from witnesses to the effect that people who acted as though they were in a kind of trance were killing and eating their victims prompted authorities to examine the bodies of some of the victims. Medical authorities in Cumberland have concluded that in all cases, the killers are eating the flesh of the people they murdered. Hi, this is Dr. Death and Mr. Vile, and you are listening to EMZT Radio. EMZT Radio is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash EMZT. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. 
for you, the listeners of EMZT Radio Podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. That's audibletrial.com slash EMZT. Now clear your mind. It knows what scares you. It has from the very beginning. Don't give it any help. It knows too much already. This is Luke and Wolf, and you're listening to EMZT Radio with your hosts, the Sinister Sisters. <laughs> Sinister Sisters. Welcome to another Sinister Sisters. I am Bane Hellborn with my sister, Scorpio Girl. And since we're now into creepy pastas and spooky stories, thanks to YouTube. (laughs) And Boom Doom. And Boom Doom. uh, We're going to read a Father's Day creepy pasta story. Yes. It's a pretty good one. And uh, we hope you enjoy it. And it's called Father's Day. Howard Simkin was a quiet man. A nice man. Everybody said so. Who could have foreseen the future? Howard grew up in the small town of Dakin B., the son of average parents of average wealth. In fact, everything about Howard's life was decidedly average. Even his job. An accountant. He was a stand-up comedian's wet dream. As a young man, Howard found it difficult mixing with others of his age and therefore became a bit of a loner. His life, like his balance sheets, calculated to boredom. Definitely into the minus column. That was until July of the summer of 1975 when he met Brenda and the balance of his life moved firmly into the plus column. He fell in love with her immediately. Howard, however, held no hopes of Brenda feeling the same way about him. How could she? Brenda, to look at, was nothing special. Most people wouldn't have given her a second glance. But to Howard, she was the air that he breathed, the sun that warmed him. One day, summoning all the courage he possessed, he asked Brenda out. And to his amazement, she agreed. Howard spent the rest of that day walking on air to think that a beautiful woman like Brenda had agreed to go out with a nobody like him. His parents were kind people, took an instant dislike to Brenda right from the start, which, however, Howard couldn't understand as he was blinded by love and could see no wrong in her. Howard was not a wealthy man, but had saved most of his money up till now as his lifestyle had been meager. This changed. In the coming months, he started spending with vigor. His savings diminished with every additional gift he bought for Brenda. The smile on her face is worth all that I own, he would tell others. However, Howard was aware of the gossip mongers, the troublemakers who had nothing to do but spend their vicious rumors. They would say that Brenda was only with him for what she could get that she was nothing but a gold digger. Shortly after his father died, Howard asked Brenda to marry him, but she said it was too soon, that she wasn't ready. Months after his father's death, his mother passed away too, as if her need to be reunited with her husband outweighed her need for life. Howard was left everything, the house, the car, and a sizable chunk of money from life insurance policies. These gains did nothing to ease his loss. He felt like his life was rapidly being drawn downwards back into the minus column. Having nothing to lose except for rejection, he plucked up the courage to ask Brenda to be his wife. This time, to his overwhelming joy, she accepted. It seemed everyone knew what was going on except poor Howard. The gravy train had pulled up and good old Brenda was determined to grab a first class seat up front. For Howard, the wedding was one of the happiest days of his life, and Brenda, well, Brenda turned up. For the first year of their marriage, everything seemed good. Howard still worshipped her and showered her with gifts. Then it happened. Brenda became pregnant. Howard was thrilled to bits. Brenda was not. Talk of abortion from Brenda's lips for the first time in their relationship, Howard put his foot down. Eight months later, at 2.32 a.m., an eight-pound, seven-ounce baby girl was born. 
Emma Louise Simkin, Howard's Pride and Joy. To Howard, Emma was a blessing. To Brenda, she was a rival. A rival for Howard's affections and, more importantly, his gifts. Things between Howard and Brenda went steadily downhill from the birth of their daughter. Brenda showed little to no interest in Emma and spent more and more time going out for various reasons. She had disclosed to Howard before they married that both her parents were dead and that she had no family to speak of. Yet all of a sudden she had sick relatives all over the country that she just had to visit. Howard had also noticed Brenda was turning more heads lately, in part due to the fine clothes and expensive makeovers he paid for. Slowly, he began to take over the role of mother as well as that as provider, and due to his very understanding boss, he was able to do more and more of his work from home in order to spend as much time as he could with his daughter. Over time, as Howard's love for his daughter grew, so did his hatred for Brenda. He wasn't stupid. He knew what she got up to on her little trips. He smelt the aftershave on her clothes. He noticed the smug look on her heavily made-up face. If it wasn't for Emma, his life would have been unbearable. Every year on Father's Day, Howard would stand Emma against the kitchen door and measure her height, making up a poem as he did and singing it to her. Emma always laughed and hugged her father while her mother would stand and sneer, assuming, of course, that she was around that particular day. It was one of these occasions that things changed. Emma was nine, and Howard just measured her. Quiet Emma, so good, so sweet. Four foot two from head to feet, he sang. Emma, as usual, hugged her father and laughed. Brenda, on the other hand, appeared in the doorway. Two suitcases by her side, the familiar sneer on her face. She told him he was pathetic and that she was leaving him. She told him a few home truths, truths that anybody in town could and did tell him over the years. Brenda's leaving made no difference to Howard, as he had spent the best part of the last seven years hating the sight of her anyway. And from that day forward, she was referred to only as Burnin' Hell Brenda. For years after her departure, everything was great. Emma was doing really well at school and had become Howard's life. He worshipped her and showered her with love and gifts as he had once done with Burnin' Hell Brenda. Then things gradually started to change when Emma hit her teens. She became unruly and disobedient. She began to run around with what he had decided were a bad crowd. He could not believe it was his Emma's fault, not even when he had visits from the police about her shoplifting. He even decided it must be something he was doing wrong. He could never think ill of his precious Emma. She would scream obscenities at him and show, and show him the finger, but he still thought it was his doing. Years before, she was grateful for the gifts he gave her. Now, she expected things, throwing temper tantrums until she got what she wanted. As time passed, things just became steadily worse and worse, and Howard yearned for the days when his daughter would hug him and laugh with him like she did every Father's Day. Time passed and he began to realize he could no longer blame others, not even himself. For Emma's behavior, it was obvious that Emma was becoming more like her mother, Burn in Hell Brenda, a clone of the woman he'd grown to despise and one bitch was enough. Howard would not suffer another, certainly not his precious daughter, Emma. So here he was. Another year had passed around and again it was Father's Day. Howard checked the temperature of the water in the bowl and, draping the flannel over the edge, picked it up. Making his way upstairs, he shouldered open the door to Emma's room, walked over to the chair next to the bed, and sat down. After wetting and wringing out the flannel, Howard began to gently bathe the stumps just below the knees where Emma's legs had once been, the legs that ran around with a bad crowd. He then began to bathe the stumps just below the elbows where her, the arms and hands had been, the hands that had given him the finger. As he bathed her, he looked into Emma's eyes to see if there was any gratitude there. Her eyes had become a lot more expressive since the removal of her tongue, the tongue that had screamed profanities at him. All Howard saw were the cold eyes of Burn in Hell Brenda staring back at him sneer fully. Draping the flannel over the bowl, Howard stood up and reaching into his pocket withdrew a tape measure. Bending over Emma's dismembered torso, he began to measure her, smiled, 
straightened up and began to sing Daddy's Little Sugar Lump, four foot two from head to stump. At this point, Howard was sure he saw laughter in Emma's eyes. The hug was missing, but he thought, you can't have everything. (laughs) (laughs) Dun, dun, dun! (laughs) Wow. Oh, that was brilliant. Happy Father's Day! Happy Father's Day, Daddy! I'd like to read you a story. It's from Angela Carter's Company of Wolves, uh, the 1984 movie. Are you going to tell me a story, Mummy? Maybe I am. Once upon a time, there was a woman in the valley, and the son of the big house did her a terrible wrong. So she came to his wedding to put wrong to right. A lavish, appointed pink tent, servants enter carrying bottles of wine in silver ice buckets, followed by other servants. A string trio plays in the background. Guests are assembled along lengthy tables placed perpendicular to the main table where the bride and groom sit together. The servant pours wine for the groom. The guests eat and drink greedily and noisily. One of the drunken guests overheard says, My dear, she was a beautiful thing. No one would have suspected a thing. The groom leans over to whisper in the bride's ear. A servant enters, bringing a cushion on which rests a sword. The bride and groom rise together. The groom takes a sword and they turn. The bride, putting her hand atop his on the sword and ceremonially cut into the bottom layer of a massive tiered pink wedding cake. A uh, guest with a full mouth states, Ladies and gentlemen, a toast to the bride and groom. To the bride and groom! A drunken guest states, Come on, lad, kiss the girl. The groom replies, With pleasure. He whispers in her ear, A taste of what's to come. They kiss. An old woman eating a chicken leg greedily. Another woman feeding her lap dog. The prolonged kiss ends as the bride pulls away decorously. Well done, sir. Good, very good. The drunken guest drinks from his wine glass. The string trio resumes playing. Music heard distantly. Crows caw at a peasant woman emerging from the trees and walks slowly towards the scene. The house and the tent beside it. Peacocks call as she walks calmly into the tent. The tent entrance is seen from behind the bride and groom. The groom says, You're every happiness, my dear. The woman comes into the tent. The groom sees her and freezes in shock. He slowly lowers his glass. The bride sees his expression and turns. She turns into profile to show that she is heavily pregnant. She looks at the assembled guests with hostile curiosity. An ornate mirror comes into view behind her on the tent wall. The guests whisper excitedly. The musicians play on. The woman takes an apple from the table and bites into it. The groom's face as she approaches him. She spits the bite of apple out at him. Guests gasp as the groom recoils. Music stops. The woman stands with the mirror behind her. So, I wasn't good enough for you. I was once. Once upon a time. The old woman still chewing the chicken leg, her mouthing the only sound is in the still tent. Don't you remember? The woman replies, don't you? The bride turns to look at the groom, then looks back at the woman. The old woman goes on eating. The woman stands in front of the mirror in which we can see the bride and groom reflected with other guests. The wolves in the forest are more decent. The music resumes. 
The woman spins round to stare into the mirror. The mirror cracks and splinters, and screams are heard loudly. She smiles coldly. In the distorted mirror, we see the groom and bride fall back into their chairs. The woman laughs harshly. In the distorted mirror, we see the groom writhing. Another pair of shoes splits, opening to reveal claws. The woman still laughing. The hairy hand bleeding from the fragments of the wine glass. More shoes splitting open. The old woman staring, fangs protruding from her open mouth. The woman looks right and then left. The woman is now looking down in horror. Hands ripping open the bodice to reveal hairy breasts, and the woman continues laughing. The old woman's fanged face is in the distorted mirror, and the woman stares proudly. A guest transformed entirely into a wolf in fine clothes leaps down from the table, an astonished servant staring. Hairy legs pumping and kicking off shoes. Jaunty music is playing now. The woman still laughs. Feet kicking. The woman looks left, eyes blazing. The drunken guest now completely transformed rips his wig off. The woman still laughing. The wolf gulps from the glass of wine as the woman leans over backwards, still laughing. The table, all the guests, now wolves. The music play on unperturbed track along the table of wolves in fine clothes the woman continually laughing a servant represses a smile the woman stares at the wolves the wolves leap down scattering cutlery and glasses a huge vase of flowers crashes down upon the table a servant stands impassive as wolves leap about him a candelabra smashes down onto the table between two wolves. Another vase of flour topples from its stands, narrowly missing the servant beside it. Wolves leap down past a statue of Cupid holding a bunch of grapes. The distorted mirror reflecting wolves leaping. The wedding cake collapses. The servants stand behind the table as it collapses under the weight of the wolves. The pack of wolves rush out of the entrance to the tent. Servants on either side looking at each other in amazement. The pack of wolves rush past an astonished peacock and vanish into the trees. More wolves rush out past servants. The distorted mirror reflects the fallen table and the servants standing behind it. The woman turns from the mirror, smiles, and bows her head with exaggerated politeness. In the mirror, we see the servants all bow to her as one. She makes an exaggerated curtsy and sweeps out of the tent. In the mirror, we see the servants helping themselves to wine. Where did you hear a story like that? It's not a story, but God's honest truth. Granny told me. And after that, the woman made the wolves come to sing to her and the baby at night. Made them come and serenade her. But what pleasure could there be in that? Listening to a lot of wolves. Don't we have to do that all the time? The pleasure would come from knowing the power that she had. And that concludes Sinister Sisters Creepy Twisted Tales. So unoriginal. I'm disappointed in you. Maybe that's because I'm not Randy. Welcome back 
to EMZT Radio Minis. I am Boom Dome. And I'm here with Aunt Bane. And we're going to do a story on Slender Man. Okay. What's Slender Man? Slender Man is a crazy dumb man who um, prayed to some dark lord. Then he turned into what he was because he someone recorded him praying in the forest. And he steals children because he can't find his daughter. And then when he learns that you're not his daughter, he kills you. And uh, how can Slender Man be stopped? Oh, you have to find the eight pages. But then in one of the other games, you have to find like twelve more. How does Slender Man uh, show up? You have to enter his place at night. What's his place? It's a forest in uh, in Norway. Does he just show up, or do you have to summon him? Well, apparently you can, but not always. What does he look like? Oh, he looks like darkness. Like he looks like he looks like a faceless being had a baby with a, with a business suited, very white man. That's how Slender Man looks. Okay. Slender Man originated as a creepypasta internet theme created by Something Awful Forums user Eric Knudsen, also known as Victor Surge in 2009. It's depicted as a thin, unnaturally tall humanoid with featureless face and head and wearing a black suit. Stories of the Slender Man commonly feature him stalking, abducting, or traumatizing people, particularly children. Mm hmm. And his story has grown so much, it has inspired a few video games and other stories. And then there's an even real live, almost murder of a 12-year-old girl by two other 12-year-old girls who wanted... Who wanted... Who wanted, who wanted Slender Man to take them. As, as his, his servants. Yeah. Yeah. The Slender Man is... A being, male in appearance, who looks like a man with extremely long, slender arms and legs. He also appears to have four to eight long black tentacles that protrude from his back, though different photographs and enthusiasts disagree on this fact. Therefore, it's theorized he can contract these tentacles at will. He is described as wearing a black suit strikingly familiar to the visage of the notorious Men in Black, and, as the name suggests, appears very thin and able to stretch his limbs and torso to inhuman lengths in order to induce fear and ensnare his prey. Once his arms are outstretched, his victims are put into something of a hypnotized state where they are utterly helpless to stop themselves from walking into them. Whether he absorbs, kills, or merely takes his victims to an undisclosed location or dimension is also unknown as there are never any bodies or evidence left behind in his wake to deduce a definite conclusion. His face is pale and slightly ghostly and appears to have been wrapped in a type of gauze or cloth. His facial features are also an object of debate and many people believe that his face looks different to each person if it's seen at all. He is sometimes portrayed wearing a hat which is sometimes a bowler, a fedora, or sometimes a top hat. He may also be seen wearing a long flowing necktie or scarf which is either gray or red. He often keeps his long, pale hands crossed politely behind his back or hanging loosely at his sides. Oftentimes, it's either reported or recorded that he can be found in sections of woods, and these generally tend to be suburban. He also has been seen with large groups of children. As many photographs portray, it's commonly thought that he resides in woods and forests and preys on children. He seems unconcerned with being exposed in daylight or captured in photos. It is often thought as well that he enjoys stalking people who become overly paranoid about his existence, purposefully giving them glimpses of himself in order to further frighten them. For this reason, it seems like Slender Man very much enjoys psychologically torturing his victims. He also often appears to float or drift around rather than walk, which suggests the possibility of him being an ethereal being rather than a creature or a man, this would explain why he is able to remain mobile in spite of his poorly proportioned body. He is seen mostly at night, peering into open windows, and walks out in front of lone motorists on secluded roads. There also seems to be a way to summon him if you want to see him. It works better at night. You go into the woods, 
Carve a circle into a tree and put an X through it. Press your face gently against the tree and close your eyes. Chant, Slender Man, Slender Man, all the children try to run. Slender Man, Slender Man, to him it's part of the fun. And then you turn around and he's supposed to be there. Okay, so when there is a monster, people want to find a way to kill him. Uh Uh-huh. So what do you think would be... Tell me your idea of a way to stop him. Put a blindfold over your eyes or just look directly down just like in Minecraft when those sneaky Endermen come up behind you. Then you look back and then you you look down and that's the one... But yeah, just blindfold yourself or look straight down. So that's the idea is... I was reading several websites where it was saying something about fear. He doesn't necessarily feed on fear, but it seems like when he shows himself... He's doing it to make you afraid, and he just loves he loves that idea that he's messing with you. So there's an idea. Don't look at him. Mm-hmm. Because that's the one thing where he starts the stuff. Yeah. So is Slender Man real or not? Highly doubt it. I mean, he is just an internet story. Mm-hmm. So what do you think people should do if they see Slender Man? Just put a blindfold on? Um, grab a katana, slice off his freaking tentacles, and look down when you're doing it. That's it, that's he. Hey, he may come back from the same dimension. But he teleports, so he could easily move out of the way and not get cut. <laughs> There's secrets to that. Have a hunting knife and look down, then chop his freaking tentacle off where he's not expecting it. Slender Man the movie comes out August 24th. Yay. Are we going to go see it? Uh, yeah, but I may point out everything you should n- not do in that movie and tell you what you should. Now I'm going to be freaking out. Well, this has been an EMCT Radio Minis. I have been your host, Boom Doom, and Aunt Bane has been here. And the next the creepy posture we're doing is uh, Smile Dog. Bye-bye. Well, that wraps up another episode of EMZT Radio. Thank you, Antonio Pantoa from One Must Fall. He was a kick in the butt. I love that guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was probably was so- one of our our better interviews in a while. Great job by everybody all around. Please go check that out. We have another interview coming up next week. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, we'll have links by the way to Antonio's um stuff in the show notes because my brain apparently isn't working today. <laughs> uh next week we'll have Ron Sterling. Yes, I know. No, Ron- not Ron Sterling. Ron- Rod Sterling coming on next week to talk about demonologist for hire. This is going to be very that interesting. That sounded interesting. Yeah. And uh, we're also going to have uh, on this as well, Ronnie M- uh, Mezzing Sterling, which I guess is, is, well, that's, that's actually Ron's full name. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. A wacky web series. That's right. So we will have him or her. It might be a her. I don't know. I've never talked to this person, so I shouldn't. I shouldn't do that. Uh, anyway, right, right. We don't know. We don't know him or her. Um, so we will have a couple of other people on with that. That could be fun. So oh yeah, yeah. That's right. Horror comes. Bring, they're bringing guests. They're bringing guests. Our guests are bringing guests now. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Well, we only did have that five-way one time. <laughs> yeah. Holy, holy, that one time we had that five-way. I'm still Remember smoking that? that cigarette. Remember that five-way we had? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> yeah. Anyways. Yodo. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Anywho. Uh, just the usual. We have a new shirt in the shop. We have a new shirt in the shop. <laughs> We're gonna have yes, another new do. shirt in the shop soon. Yeah, I have. I've. I am now officially finishing up the logo for the new shirt. 
Okay. So we will have the new shirt in the shop coming up soon. We have a new shirt in the shop. It is uh, on the front. It says, keep your pleasure room, Mr. Gray. And on the back, it says... I have a puzzle oh, box. Yes, yeah. right. I have a puzzle box. It's on the back. You'll, you'll like the shirt. Yeah. I tried to get the. Yeah. I tried to match the colors of the puzzle box, but it didn't really work out very well. Mm, it's still okay. Yeah. So, anyways, head over to Teespring to check that out. Links in the description. Links in the description. Facebook, Twitter. Come join us on Discord. We're going to start uh, movie night soon. Ooh. We're going to try every Saturday night to have a movie night on Rabbit. So you, and you'll have to sign up. Yeah, you'll have to sign up on the uh, EMZT Discord to get okay. the rabbit link to join us. We're thinking about the first movie is probably going to be Heavy Metal. Oh, oh. The original shit. Heavy Metal. Oh, oh mostly, shit. Mostly because I've been binge watching South Park on Hulu mm-hmm. and the episode Major Boobage <laughs> came on. Right. Which, if you have not seen that, it is basically a tribute to Heavy Metal. Yep. <laughs> Namely, one certain character in heavy metal <laughs> <laughs> with rocking tits. Okay. Oh my god. Hey, they use the line in the show, so that's, you know, just quoting the show. Nice. If anybody wants to come bash my brains in, just to make it quick. Don't forget to clamp my nipples. Uh, anyways. <laughs> and did we mention we're on Spotify now? Yes, Woo! we're on Spotify. So check us out. We're on Spotify. We're on Twitter. We're on Podbean. We're on. YouTube, we're on um, uh, Discord, we're on uh, Facebook, we're on, um, well, my personal Instagram, but uh, that doesn't really matter. Uh, <laughs> you won't find the link in the description for that. Uh, no. no. <laughs> of course, if you want my nudes on Snapchat, five ninety nine a day. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> okay, Goes into I, his PayPal account. Yeah, I, I don't have a Snapchat, for those of you wondering. I I don't. I don't. Because the only thing I've ever known Snapchat to be used for is nudie pictures. But um, anyways, I I think we're done. Well, plus now they have that new feature to find people that they give out your location. That's no good. Yeah, that's no good. I don't want to whip my pee-pee out for some girl to see and then she finds out where I live. Yeah, and comes out. Kind of the point of... uh, Well, I guess in a way that's a good thing. (laughs) And for the record, I have never done that on social media. No. I don't whip my pee pee no. out and show everybody. No, no. You have to ask that was or a pay. Horror. That that was a horror movie too. Yeah. <laughs> it's also a scandal with the New York Jets. But uh, anyways, yeah. I, I digress. Uh, <laughs> gentlemen, please do not text your junk to women. All right. That that yeah, it's that's. Not cool. If you don't learn anything else in this podcast, please just do us that one favor. Do not text your junk to women. Yeah. All right. That that ain't cool. Unless they ask for it. Now, if they ask for it, now, you know, if they it. ask for it, then do it. But if they don't ask for it, don't but, fucking do it. But, but if they ask for it, please tasteful nudes. Okay. Yes. Put a beret on top. <laughs> Give it that little extra pizzazz, you know. Yeah. And make sure your dick's longer than five inches. But uh, okay. I'm just okay. saying. You know, make sure your dick's longer <laughs> than five inches. Make sure the angle is just right. You know, lighting, angles, that sort of thing. You, know, you still have to set the mood when you're sending pictures of your junk. How much further is this hole going to go? <laughs> I have no idea, but I have a shovel and I'm just going to keep digging. Uh, anyways, I have a shovel and I'm not afraid to use it. Because we go there. Because we go there. <laughs> we wish we didn't go there some days, but we go there. Yeah. Anyways, uh, we need yeah. to wrap this up uh, because we have interviews to get to and we have um, other things we need to get to. Don't forget. Oh, don't forget our streaming is going on. Uh, I'm sure Bane will be streaming soon. I am personally streaming on uh, our EMZT Productions Mixer. We do have a Twitch, but usually we just use the Twitch to uh, mock and ridicule our friends. <laughs> Stream on Twitch. Uh, shout out to our friends of the British nerds too, because um, they yeah. When we get programming up on Twitch, they are gonna be nice enough to let us host them, host their show, the Geek End oh. every week. Ooh, so, yeah. Uh, so Sarah and Jasmine, if you're nice. listening, uh, bitches of horror live show. If that doesn't happen soon, I, I will annoy the crap out of you on 
Facebook until you do it. <laughs> I'm just <Be> saying. <laughs> okay. And the rest of you podcasters, yes, please. Um, if you do one of those uh, podcasts, unlike ours, where you don't play music and you just talk for an hour, fucking stream it, man. Yeah. Have an audience. Do it in front of an audience. We're going to do ours in front of an audience one day. It won't be on stream, I'm sure. But you know, we'll, you know what? If we ever get enough people in Discord, we will do the show live on Discord when, at, at least once a month. Okay. So there's your incentive I... to sign up to our Discord. Yeah. Once a month, we will do a show on Discord. There you, you go. You can participate. It'll be the Rocky Horror Picture Show, Ooh. the Rocky Horror Picture Podcast. <laughs> where I think we'll, that's already we'll, a thing. <laughs> I know. It is. It's like, and, it, and it's lovely as hell. Um, yeah. Shout out to them, too. And shout out to everybody who does a podcast. I mean, seriously, our friends and Potter and family, really, we love you fuckers. All right? We do. We love you yes. fuckers. You guys, you, guys, awesome. you guys are awesome. You help spread the word of our show. And we, you know, hopefully we do a decent job in return of spreading the word of your show. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you got a film project, art project, anything horror related, you want us to uh, promote emztradio at gmail.com link will be in the description or the email will be in the description as well if you want to promote you want us to promote something we do it for free because we do it because we are passionate about the indie horror community not just the indie horror community but the indie film community in general because you know what F Hollywood all right I'll just say that right now F Hollywood Mm -hmm. you guys the the real creators down here at the lower levels where you don't have 300 million dollars and a fucking green screen you you have no idea how to use. Um, Right. You guys are the awesomeness. So we want to help you out. Independent movies definitely rock. Please go check out. Support these people on Patreon. Support these people on uh, Indiegogo or the thousands of other crowdfunding sites. If they're crowdfunding a movie and you like the idea, just, hell, just own five bucks. Even if you don't get a perk, yeah. just throw them five bucks, all right? Yeah, yeah. Do that. Do that just one show thing. a little love. Support, show yeah. a little love. Support these people that really aren't going to make any money off of this crap. And they, and they half of them know they're not going to make any money. They're just doing it for fun. All they right? do it because they want to and they love it. Exactly. They're, they're putting up a lot of their own money to go shoot in the woods. Yes. So just, just do that. <laughs> Anyways, um... Yeah, look for some YouTube content to be coming soon, I hope, from us. Hopefully. Hopefully. If we can ever figure out what the hell working to do. Working on it. And, yeah, and, working on and it. And I'm still working yeah. on... I'm still in the planning phase. Uh, anyway. Yeah. I, my ideas... I get these good ideas, and then I forget to write them down, and then I forget the ideas. I'm like, God damn it! Yeah. I am I'm dating somebody that actually went to school for uh, animation. So hopefully I can work with yeah. her on some things. All right. Anyways, Ooh, till next. An animation series. That's an yeah. idea. Yeah. Billy, the social justice warrior demon. Uh, <laughs> anyways. Okay. Yeah. Have, have we done enough damage now? I think we need to find the ladder instead of the shovel. Okay. Yeah. I agree. All right. Anyways, <laughs> for next week, Bane, take us out of here. And stay tuned for another episode of EMZT Radio. I am a singing telegram. <laughs>